Let's start by visiting the Raspberry Pi website and downloading the installer for your operating system. I recommend going for the 64-bit version since it's around 25% faster on modern Raspberry Pi 4 models and above. You have two options, the desktop version or the headless light version. The desktop version lets you connect a monitor, keyboard and mouse to your Raspberry Pi, allowing you to develop your web application directly on it. For this project, I'll be using the headless light version and accessing it remotely. Whichever version you choose, you'll need to select your storage and write the image to your SD card. If you go with the light version, once it's booted up, the first thing we need to do is enable SSH. We'll start by entering the sudo raspi-config command. This brings up the software configuration tool. From there, select interface options, then choose SSH, and select yes. Once SSH is enabled, we just need to find out our IP address. You can do this by using the hostname minus capital I command. Make sure you note this down, as we'll be using it frequently. Now let's install PuTTY from the official website. Make sure to download the 64-bit version that matches your OS. After downloading, follow the installation prompts. PuTTY is a popular SSH client for Windows, which allows you to connect to your Raspberry Pi and interact with it. It's lightweight and straightforward to use, making it an ideal tool for remote server management. Once PuTTY is open, you'll need to input your username and the IP address we found earlier. Keep the port as 22, save the session under a name like Web Dev Server so you can easily reconnect to it later. The first time you connect, you'll be prompted to accept the RSA key. Go ahead and accept it, and now we're in. First thing we need to do is update the Raspberry Pi. Run the following command to update your package list sudo app update. This command refreshes the list of available packages and their versions. Next, upgrade your install packages to the latest versions. This is using the sudo app upgrade command. Keeping your Raspberry Pi OS and its packages up to date ensures you have the latest features and security patches. The update command checks for updates and the app upgrade installs them. Now let's install Apache, the web server software. We use the sudo app install Apache 2. Apache is one of the most widely used web servers globally. It serves web pages to clients like your browser and handles requests to display content over the internet or on your local network. Now Apache is running. To confirm this, open your browser and enter your Raspberry Pi's IP address that we noted earlier. You should see the default Apache web page. Next, we'll install the database server. We're installing MariaDB instead of MySQL. MariaDB is a community developed fork of MySQL that's fully compatible but often considered more secure and faster. If for some reason the installation doesn't go smoothly, run the sudo app update dash dash fix dash missing command. MariaDB and MySQL are relational database management systems that store data in structured tables. They're essential for dynamic websites where data like user information or content needs to be stored and retrieved efficiently. Let's retry the installation by running the sudo app install MariaDB server command again. Once installed, check the status to ensure it's running using the sudo system ctl status mysql command. Next, we'll secure the database by running the sudo mysql underscore secure underscore installation command. Running this command is critical for security, especially if your Raspberry Pi is accessible over the internet. This step helps prevent unauthorized access to your databases. Let's move on to installing PHP, along with the necessary libraries for Apache and mysql. You can see the command here is using the app install command followed by PHP and then the two libraries. PHP is a scripting language used to create dynamic web pages. We'll confirm the installation by creating a PHP info page. PHP is a powerful scripting language that runs on the server side and this is what enables you to create dynamic and interactive websites. It's widely used and integrates seamlessly with Apache and MySQL. Then we can open our browser and visit our IP address followed by info.php. The PHP info function outputs all the configuration information about PHP on your server. This includes version, installed extensions, and server environmental details, which are useful for debugging and optimizing your setup. Using the sudo app install php myadmin command, we'll install a web interface for managing your databases. Make sure to select Apache 2 during the setup. This is shown by the asterisk when selected, and also note down your password. PHP myadmin is a user-friendly web application that allows you to interact with your MySQL databases without needing to use a command line. It's excellent for beginners and those who prefer the graphical interface. After installation, you might find that you don't have full privileges in PHP MyAdmin. To fix this, we need to run these commands inside the MySQL shell. Now, when you log on to PHP MyAdmin, you should have full control. Privileges in MySQL control what each user does. 
the previous commands grant permissions to the PHP MyAdmin user, ensuring that you can manage your databases through PHP MyAdmin. To secure PHP MyAdmin will restrict access to your local network. In my case, it's the 192.168.0.0. Once done, we'll reload Apache by using the sudo systemctl reload apache2 command. Restricting access to PHP admin by IP range helps secure your database management interface, ensuring only devices within your local network can access it. To make sure everything's working, we'll reload our PHP MyAdmin page. With that, our web server is fully functional and secure enough for use on a local network. Now, let's look at how to transfer an existing project or files to the web server. For this, we'll be using FileZilla. It's a reliable FTP client. We'll download it from the official website. FileZilla is a robust tool for transferring files between your computer and server, ensuring secure and reliable file transfers. Once installed, you'll see a two-pane interface, local files on the left and remote server files on the right. So the first thing we need to do is set up your site by going to Site Manager, click on New Site, give it a name, we'll change the protocol to SFTP and keep the port at 22 and enter your Raspberry Pi's IP address. We'll enter your username and password and then click Save. Using SFTP or SSH file transfer protocol with FileZilla provides a secure way to upload and manage files on your server. We'll navigate to the var www.html directory on your server where the web files are stored. To streamline future transfers, we'll set this up as your default remote directory in the Site Manager's Advanced tab. Setting default directories in FileZilla helps speed up your workflow by automating the navigation to your project folders each time you connect. If you encounter a permission denied error when uploading files, it's because your web directory is owned by the root user. We'll fix this by changing the ownership and permissions. File ownership and permissions in Linux are crucial for security and functionality. By signing the correct permissions, you ensure that your web server can read and write files as needed without compromising security. First, create a group called WebDev and add the WebDev user to it. Then change the group ownership of the web directory Set the permissions so that the group can read, write and execute and make sure new files inherit these permissions. Finally, we can check that everything is set up correctly. Now we should be able to upload the files successfully using FileZilla. Perfect! As an extra, let's move a small existing project and its database to our web server. OK, as before, we'll be using FileZilla for file transfers and a combination of PuTTY and PHP MyAdmin to manage our database. Let's start by transferring the files to the server. With FileZilla open, we can make a connection to our saved web server because we saved our credentials in the earlier chapter. Once FileZilla is open, locate your project folder. In this case, it's called Celebrate. You can either right click the folder and select Upload, or if you have synchronized browsing enabled, you can double click the folder. This will automatically create the remote directory on the server and allow you to see all the individual components within it. You can then select the files you want to upload. After you've uploaded everything, you should receive a successful transfer message. At this point, your project files are on the live server, but we're not done yet because we need to transfer the database. Start by opening PHP MyAdmin on your local machine or whichever environment you're using for development. Log into PHP MyAdmin and navigate to the Celebrate database. This is where all your project data lives. We'll need to export this database so we can import it on our live server. When exporting, choose the custom export method to have more control. Select the database you want to export. Leave the format as SQL, which is the most straightforward format for this kind of operation. If you only want to transfer the structure of the database without data, you could select that option. But in our case, we want everything, both the structure and the data. Then leave everything else as default and click export. Now you have an SQL file containing our database. Open this file in your preferred text editor and take a quick look. You'll see SQL commands that create the database, tables and the data to import. We'll copy these commands into a text document for easier management during the transfer. Next, log into PHP MyAdmin on your live server. You'll notice that the Celebrate database doesn't exist yet, so we need to create it. You could manually create the database through PHP MyAdmin, but since we have the SQL commands from our export file, it's easier to use those. Let's open PuTTY and open the previously saved session. You can execute these commands either in PHP MyAdmin's SQL tab or via the command line using PuTTY. There may be occasions where you don't have access to PHP MyAdmin. So let's look at both the command line and PHP MyAdmin's graphical interface. I start with a command create table if not exists. 
We'll omit the default character set in this example, as the existing default is usually sufficient. Our command has created our database. You can see this if we head over to phpMyAdmin and refresh the page. Another way to confirm that the Celebration World database has been created is to use the show database command via our putty session. Our next command is use celebration wall. This will get us into the database itself and is the equivalent to clicking on the database name within PHP MyAdmin. Following on, we'll create the table. For simplicity, we'll select all of the command up until the default character set. This command creates our messages table and all the columns within it. This time, to show this works both ways, we will paste the create table command into PHP MyAdmin SQL tab. Make sure that you've selected the correct database. Great. Now when we click the table, we can see the columns described under the structure tab. On the putty session, we can use the command show tables to show the tables within the selected database. And we use the describe messages command to describe our table structure. The last part of the import is the data itself. This is optional depending on whether you want to start from scratch or transfer any existing data. Once again, we will paste it into the PHP MyAdmin SQL tab, which we can confirm by clicking the browse tab on the PHP MyAdmin or we can use the select command in our putty session. Now our database is exported, we have two more tasks left. Create a new user in the database for our project and update any references within our project with our new user. Let's open our project in VS Code and amend the first file, commenting out the old username and password and inputting the new username and password. With this done, we can upload our file to the web server. If we have a quick look at our project on our web server, and use the inspector, we can see that it's throwing an error. I didn't know this before recording, but Microsoft Edge now kindly includes the Copilot AI on the inspector, which can provide a handy insight, and this just confirms that it's most likely a database connection issue, namely an authentication issue. So let's create a user. The create user command will use our username followed by localhost separated by an at symbol. This means the user account will only be able to access the database on the local server, then followed by the password in plain text. Looking at our PHP MyAdmin instance, we can see that our new user has been created. Our grant command allows all privileges to the MyWeb user on the local server. This period star indicates that it applies to all tables within the Celebration Wall database. We follow this with the flush privileges command so that the above commands can take effect. Now, if we click on MyWeb user in PHP MyAdmin and select the database link, we can see the privileges have been set. For a basic CRUD application, which stands for Create, Read, Update and Delete, it's generally sufficient and expected to see Privileges as All Privileges, Grant as No and Table Specific Privileges as No. This ensures that the username has the minimal access required, which can help prevent hacking attempts such as SQL injection. When we revisit our remote web server and refresh the page, the error has disappeared and our messages are now displayed on the database. I thought I'd finished at this point, but when I submitted a message, I got an error on the submit message PHP file. Can you guess what the problem is? If we head over to the file, we can see that I forgot to update the username and password. Let's correct this and upload it to the server. And that's my favorite bit. In part two, we'll harden the server even further by setting up HTTPS with an auto renew certificate, a DNS name, and connect to it from the internet. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. Feel free to subscribe, like and comment and hopefully I'll see you in part two.